Hello, and welcome to the Family Histories podcast, the show for and about those of us who are sat quietly in libraries, archives, and spare rooms all around the world, tirelessly piecing together our collective social and family history. My name is Andrew Martin, I'm a family historian, and I'll be your host. In this episode, The Resistant, we'll be hearing about a woman who helped save the lives of airmen as part of the French Resistance, and we'll be on the hunt for a 16th century baptism somewhere in France. So, put down that old court roll, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is a historian, a lecturer, a media consultant, and a professional Anglo-Belgian genealogist. She is the author of The Guide to Genealogy in Belgium, and somehow she also finds time to work as a country manager for the genealogy company My Heritage. So before she writes The Guide to Getting Bored During Podcast Introductions in Belgium, I should introduce my guest, Marie Kapar. Hello, Marie. Welcome to the Family Histories podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And it's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you very much. So we always start with the same question, and that is to find out how did you get interested in researching your family history? Oh, so it goes a long way because actually I started quite young. I know that it's the case for a lot of genealogies, but... um, In my case, it's really funny because I didn't realize I was doing genealogy. (laughs) Okay. I started with my grandmother when I was about eight or nine or something. I would be absolutely, and from the get-go, passionate about the story she was telling me about her own family. My great grandfather, a father who was who fought in World War One and then in World War Two, and he had plenty of stories to tell because he was in the army, but he was a musician in the army. Right. And the band got disbanded at the beginning of the war yeah. because at first everybody was sent to the front, like any help was valuable, even poor musicians who were living by Mozart and, <laughs> and they were selling, sent to the battlefields and he of course got very upset with that and I used to love when she was telling me stories about that time because it was the first feeling that I can pinpoint when I think of the time she was telling me that, is that They were blood relatives to me, and I didn't know them. They weren't around anymore, but she did. And that was so fascinating to me about that, is that she had lived, let's say, adventures with them, and they are my family, and they are not around anymore, but she had memories of what happened. And I would spend like hours asking her, oh, what was it like and what was happening? And, you know, you had to go to the concert and you had to go to uh, the theater with him and to the horses race and you met the king. And and I would absolutely roll into the stories, looking forward, taking notes. It's really funny because I found recently while emptying a house, I found like old notes of my childhood writing, writing and absolutely not the way a genealogist would do it, like should do it. But (laughs) I took notes of the names of the people. Oh, wonderful. Well, it sounds like you've ended up with a whole load of notes that are crucial to your research. It's funny because on those notes, they were like, when I was reading it with my now eyes of family historian, I was, oh my God, I shouldn't have asked that way or I should have asked like... I uh, wrote the name of the street, but not the number. Ah, okay. Well, maybe that's uh, slightly flawed then. So it was so it was so incomplete, but then it was so sweet to see my nine years old self doing family history without knowing that she was doing family history, and somehow it all came like naturally. And afterwards, I started to gather information. One one day, my mom saw that there was like an open door at the archives or something, open door there at the archive. And she took me. Oh, nice. And I never left. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. <laughs> well, why would you? I arrived there. There were like all those gentlemen, not my generation, let's put it that way. <laughs> and 
they totally embrace the young teen me coming to the archive with my papers, like, I want to find my family, and, you know, can you help me find my grand-grandfather? Uh, wedding, and, and you have to know that one of the difference between Belgian records and um, for instance, British records, is that the Belgian and the French records are way longer in length. Wedding records, for instance, can make like from one and a half pages to three or four pages. Wow. So not like a BMD's wedding and sometimes, and there are lengthy details and stuff. So they really, those bunch of old gentlemen, it's so funny because they would meet afterwards at the pub and I, you know, they were always teasing that. I couldn't, they would invite me, but I couldn't go. <laughs> and they really took me upon their, their, their wings and they really showed me the ropes and tricks of being a family historian at that time. Yep. And what is so really, well, sadly, of course, now some of them, a lot of them have sadly passed away. But the great thing is that at the end of, let's say, their genealogy careers, I was the one showing them how to do it online <laughs> when they were the one at first showing me how to use microfiche or how to read an index on the old machines and and how to print from the machine and the rolls and how you sieve it and use it and it kind of gone full circle that was so sweet of them and i remember i was about 15 or 16 and I had to ask for a permission at the Royal Library because I wanted to check a book for a history essay because by that time I had found a school with a history option, which was brilliant. I had to get a special request permission to the board of the Royal Library to get in. Okay. Because the, the in-house rules were for... Um, another age, like you had to be like 25 to have a card or something. It was still the old school, old style rules. And I was 15 or 16 or something. So I had to write a snail mail letter <laughs> to the board. I was granted permission, of course. I oh, absolutely well lowered the age level of the <laughs> reading room I bet. just by setting my food on it. But it was, it was, yeah, but that was, that, that, that was so sweet and I learned from there and I never stopped. And later I um, did history at university because there were no like family history lectures or curses. Yeah. And one thing that was very interesting because in Belgium for a long, long time, much less so right now in the last decade or some even, genealogy had that, you know, old gent reputation of old gentlemen meeting at 5, 40 or more mm -hmm. and uh, doing their stuff to find like a noble line or to claim something or land of titles of deeds. Yeah. And some university lecturers still had that very perception of that. And I remember one of my first sessions with a lecturer at the university. The lecturer said, well, he was making around, you know, asking questions to the students. And I, I was so passionate about family history. I was like, yeah, my thing is family history. I love it so much, blah, blah, blah. It's so great. It's so nice to dive into the life of our ancestors. And he, he just like looked down at me like as if he had said something very not very nice. Oh. And he was, miss, we are not here to discuss an old man, Obi. <gasps> and I'm like, Okay, <laughs> All right, I've met a friend. <laughs> so I absolutely said nothing more about it. Like for a long, long time, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? But the absolute silver lining to that is that years, years back, I was signing the book you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. in the history fair yep. somewhere. And he had a lecture and I had a lecture. And in the speaker's lounge, he came to me and apologized. Well, that's good. I'm glad. And he said, I hadn't realized oh, yeah. that your perception of family history was crossing social history at the micro level of families and gathering data and crossing them. And 
and that it's what you meant. And I was, yeah, I could have explained you if we had pursued the exchange, <laughs> but you didn't. You just kept me short saying, we're not going to do family history in this room, miss. You know, you stop. And and I, I found it very classy of him to come to me and apologize about that. Well, I'm glad that he remembered and that he apologized. I hope he felt sorry for quite a long time. So what was it that inspired you to write the Guide to Genealogy in Belgium? Well, actually, it was when I realized that, so long story short, I did my master in history, um, did several jobs during my studies and on the side and after also, like absolutely not historical related, then came at the crossroad of my career when I could, you know, jump in the professional genealogy boat, which I did with a great pleasure, and I don't regret it one second. But I was at some point, not swam, but there was not a day with not somebody asking me like a basic questions, like a need for education, really. People, I could see that people were lost, that people didn't know where to look, where to start, what to gather, okay. our sources. And I realized there were some guys, but they weren't really what I myself had perhaps hoped to read. And maybe that's the thing about book writing is about always write a book that you want to read too, or that you wish that existed at some point of your journey. And so that's why I started to write. And then I, I, I had the discussion with the publisher and he was like, oh yeah, but that's a good idea because people love genealogy, but they don't know how to start. Perhaps you could write a white audience book that helps people to get started and that's how it happened and then I was okay let's get let's write it as if I was explaining to someone like maybe one of the lectures that I give about getting started in Belgian genealogy and Belgian records okay let's do this but on a book form that's how it happened. You describe yourself on your Twitter profile as a DNA geek how did you become a geek in that area and um, what kind of puzzles has that solved for you? Yeah, well, I really love, well, just like a lot of us, I jump on the DNA boat when it uh, arised uh, a few years back. But what I love with genetic genealogy is that doing your test and having you tested in any of the company that's around gets you the pieces of, you just buy the puzzle with all the million pieces in it. And it's the beginning of the process. Yeah. Some people often get mistaken about DNA results because they only want to know, okay, right, I'm 20% Viking, I'm 30% Spanish, yeah. I'm... Yeah. Okay, and fair enough, that's that's the fun part. That and but for the family story and that's not the most important part. True. Yeah. And it's the beginning of the game. You only it, it's what I love is that it's a bit of like a Russian doll thing. It's, you know, you receive your results and then there are there's something to do inside or a kinder egg. And uh and from there, of course it takes time. Of course it takes like a little bit of skills, but there are so many resources about DNA for people to learn how to get started and get advanced. But of course, and that's why I define myself as a geek, is because the more obscure the article will be about, you know, something genetic advanced or even ancient population advanced or something, uh, it's uh, like the cilantro gene or something. <laughs> it's really, or the, the red hair, obviously, the red hair yeah. gene too. Uh, that, that really got me interested. And beyond all the basic or even advanced for, for genetic genealogists, um, education about matches, about browsers, about segments, about SNPs, about all that, Beyond that, it's so interesting that I even, during one part of the pandemic, I even took um, a bio-like lecture that was open, kind of open university courses on biology, because I was, okay, but, you know, this is very interesting, a topic beyond the old genealogy, the old biology thing. 
and genetic is really interesting and okay let's get interested in that and then and I took that course that uh, it was like only a free I didn't you know I just follow it out of interest but yes I'm really my google suggestions uh, sends me a lot of DNA articles <laughs> <laughs> yeah I bet it does it's worked out what you're interested in now Obviously, you work for uh, one of the DNA testing companies. What's it like to work for MyHeritage and how did you end up working for them? Oh, well, MyHeritage and I, we have a long story because I was using MyHeritage a long time before I even worked for them. And I first first approached for some webinars about Belgian archives and then some articles and some research that needed going to the Belgian archive, for instance, that kind of things. Okay. And at some point, they decided to broaden or to strengthen their European market. And they say, hey, would you be interested to uh, come and work for us for Belgium and also France? And I was there like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Bring it on. I'm not afraid. I love it. And then, yeah, it's the role itself is a bit different than what I'm doing uh, with my research company. So it's a little bit less research, although I do uh, some research as well. We made a nice discovery for Beyonce last year, oh. discovering that she had Belgian roots. I knew she was from Louisiana, so I was okay. Surely there got to be some French somewhere. Yeah. And true enough, I found some French for her. But in all the French, there was I was sorting a French lines, and then at some point I found one husband, and he was from Belgium. And I was at first I thought it was a joke. Oh well, not a joke, but I was okay. Maybe the location is a name is a namesake from a French location or something. Maybe this is wrong. Maybe it's not the right place. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, and I went to check the records, the parishes' records for that place, and indeed, I found I found the baptism for her ancestors. So she has Belgian roots. Wow! Isn't it just thoroughly distracting though for you? Because I think if I worked for my heritage, I would probably just spend all my time trying to find records for my own tree instead of actually doing any work that I'm paid by them to do. That. <laughs> So luckily enough, there's enough work at my heritage because my heritage always launches new feathers and new collections, and there's always we just launch all news, so newspaper collection database, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, so luckily we we already are being kept busy, but it means that indeed after my work hours I dive into my company to uh, which which is a kind of a plus side by the way it's a bit of minus point time wise but it's also helped because sometimes putting my user cap instead of my staff cap, helps me to pinpoint things that can be, you know, better or sometimes even little bugs or sometimes little things that I'm like, hey, guys, I was browsing that collection and the result comes that way and can we make it that little? Yeah. And so uh, so it's an advantage. But yes, of course, I, I'm tempted. But just the same that I would be tempted to look for me when... I go to the archive for a client. I know I'm there for the client and I need to check what the clients are saying. Yeah, that's true. Of course, if there's a bit of time remaining on the day, I will stay at the archive and check something for me. But it's work first. You first have to go through whatever you have to do. And then only if you know there's time remaining, then you can focus on on your own research. So what keeps you motivated with family history? I'm not always that motivated. And this brings me to the point of saying that, and I always say that, I think I said it in the book and I think I say it in lectures. Genealogy has to be fun. Yeah. You have to get up and go about your day and and find an interest and, and a trigger and a passion and a will to, if you at some point are bored or if, you know, if you just like, you know, bang your hand on the wall because there's a brick wall and you can't get around. Mm-hmm. Genealogy is a serious matter, as I told my dear lecturer, <laughs> but if you don't find any fun in doing it, if you 
you know, or you are forced to go to the archive, or you're just like, I don't want to go. Don't do it. Nobody's forced to do genealogy. So what keeps me motivated is, especially towards others, is to help them when they either... A, understand how it works, and they can use it for themselves, and that's the goal of the book. Or, if I provide some, if not answers, at least explanation as to where did that ancestor live, who, who was the ancestor, or even why you can't find that ancestor, because the record where his baptism is supposed to be has burned. And no one has a copy. Like, it was the only copy of the parish register. It sadly burned. We can think of alternative sources, but there's no guarantee we're going to find them. But at least you know that the reason you don't find the baptism is not you or your method. Of course, we all want to have as less as genealogical frustrations as possible. Yeah, we all do. Definitely. But... We need to learn that there are going to be frustrations. There are going to be records we won't find and we would love to. There are going to be answers that are going to be unanswered. But there are going to be so many other answers and so many other questions coming from the answer that you pulled at some point. It's like a world thread. You just, you know, you grab one answer and then there are so many questions coming with that answer. And then you open more boxes and you proceed from there. So there's always something to find interest in. And if at some point you are no longer interested or you are losing motivation of will because of one case of one part that you were working on that is, you know, buggering you for days and then you're like, oh, my God, it takes a toll on me. I'm not that, you know, I, I have to find it, but I don't want... Leave it on the side. Take a break. Do something else. Start another genealogical project. Pick another one. Family history can take us to all sorts of places. The good, the bad, and the just plain ugly. Yes, it's that time of the show where my guest picks one of their most fascinating relatives that they've researched and then tell us their life story. OK, Marie, who are you going to introduce us to? So I really, really would love to talk to you, Andrew, about my great home. So it's not that far. It's my great home on my mother's side. So the sister of my grandfather, well, of my legal grandfather, but that's another story. And she is called Marguerite Nichols, uh, married name Wigren. Okay. And the reason I always want to showcase her and highlight a life and pay the tribute for her is that, well, I should have known her normally, but I never got to know her because she perished in World War II. Oh. And the reason that I always want to tell about her and about her life is also because the suffering in the family was so massive that I only heard of her existence when I was about the time that I had that card at the Royal Library. Okay. Uh, so 16, 17, something yeah. like that. When we covered Second World War in school, and obviously you learn about all the gruesome things that had happened during the Shoah, and you are shown documentaries. And so and came back home super upset about that. And the thing is that I sat down and I was upset about uh, everything that we had covered in school that day. Yep. And my mother posed and said, she, oh, just like my own. And I'm like, what? Which own? Oh. I always assumed that my granddad was an only child. Oh, wow. And until that day where my Mother said, like, well, my own, yes, my aunt Maggie, she died in a camp. And I was, what? How come I only know that now? <laughs> it's not possible. And from that moment on, that very, I can still picture myself in my mom's living room 
talking to her about it and being absolutely shocked and astonished that I didn't even know she existed. Oh, wow. And I was already doing family history by then. So at some point, somebody should have, not even my grandmother mentioned it, nobody. And nobody pointed out like, okay, no, you need to have one sister and she died, but I don't want to talk about it. Not even that, nothing. And all of a sudden I was, what happened? And I, of course, explored journey and find information about her. So she was my grandfather's youngest sister by about two years, I think. And they were from a British family, but living in Belgium already. So uh, I'm the kind of second to third generation, depending on how you put it. And taking into account that on both World War, the family went to, back to England at some point. And it's funny because the refugees coming from Belgium during both World War were welcome in Earth Court in London. And I remember something that my grandmother would always, always, always repeat to me when we were talking about the war. She would always say, Marie, if there's a war that breaks out, you have to go to London, you have to go to Earth Court. She was like, there's a war and we get separated at some point and you don't, you don't know where to go and what to do and uh, maybe then something that destroyed the house. You have to go to London and you have to go to Earth Court. And on my first days in London, I would always book a hotel around Earth Court for that reason. And she would always put that in my mind very clear that I remember Earth Court if there was a war going on. And my great grandfather, Frank Nichols of Beagle, was a policeman's son from Derbyshire, and he became a horse trainer. And he was uh, training horses in Newmarket, oh. which is a big place in England yeah. for horse racing. Sure is, I know it well. And a Belgian lord was very into horses. He's like, he had you know, many, many like race horses, great horses. And he thought it would be fancy to hire like British lads and jockeys and, and all this stuff was British. And he went to Newmarket, he hired like a whole group. There were about a dozen of them, made them come to Belgium. And that's how my family arrived in Belgium in the first place. Ah, I see. And so... Uh, Frank uh, had two uh, children, Louis and uh, Marguerite. His Belgian wife became British by marriage. Mm -hmm. So he had those two children. And Marguerite, during World War II, well, I don't have a lot of sources for her between her birth and a wedding. Okay. I have some pictures, not a lot, but I have a bit of pictures. But she first married a Swedish guy. Uh, named Alvar Wigren, and the guy, it was already his third marriage. <laughs> he was older, he was always marrying young ladies. Oh, okay. The two first wives died, and that's a bit... Uh-oh, suspicious. Okay, dodgy, suspicious, minded ground, I don't know what happened, but they all both died like, it was a it was his third wedding, let's put it that way. And <laughs> okay. he was older. And he married her. And they lived in a suburb of Brussels. And she had no children. And she was about 30 or something at the outbreak of the war. My grandfather, his wife, and my two uncles fled to England. And I have a little diary that was written by another hound, which is that she would... I did um, in a lingerie. <laughs> <laughs> and she wrote, like, we walked on the road and we saw the planes and we saw the soldiers. And she would tell all the way of May 40 to France. And she really documented and they slept in school. Now, you have to imagine that they were, like, family of not particularly super well off, but a good average family in Brussels, Belgium. Okay. I don't even think she ever saw a co before. And she was walking on the country roads with all the refugees fleeing the bombings and the attacks. 
and they slept rough in the school. My aunt was very shocked. She wrote, she said, somebody got up at night to go to the bathroom and was shot or something. And so I didn't dare to go to the bathroom because, you know, I didn't want to be shot. But my grand home, she stayed behind. She stayed with her husband. I don't know if the husband said, we're not going with the others. I don't know about that, but she was left behind. And family lure says that the last boat to England. Mm, I'm not sure about that, about the very last boat, but, you know, they took a boat to England, that's for sure. And my great aunt Marguerite, she stayed behind and she started to enroll in the resistance, Ooh. which may have been kind of reaction to her staying behind or being forced to stay behind or uh, maybe she wanted to join a family. She could have. She was still British, so she could have gone with them, but sure. maybe she was forced to stay behind. But she started to be active in the resistance and she started to hide pilots from the Royal Air Force and from the Royal Canadian Air Force. Wow. And she actually saved the life of three guys who I could identify and who survived the wars, all three, and at least two of them had children. So that was really sweet to know. Yeah, it was. But what a very dangerous and brave thing for her to do. But sadly, she was gave away. Oh. And I have my doubts and theory about who could have gave her away and it could have been a husband. I have no proof about that, of course. But what I do know is that on the morning of the 2nd of February, 1942, the Gestapo knocked out her door and arrested her. And they took the husband too, but he only went to a camp in the country for a month before coming back to town. And she was first taken to the Gestapo office, which is maybe maximum two miles from her home. And I often did the journey by car to check how much time it would have been in that car with that Gestapo officers. She first is being quizzed at the Gestapo office, then sent to a local prison that was used by the Nazis. And then another week later or something, she sent to Germany in a, uh, Ravensbrück, the women camp. And she dies there. After several months, um, she died. And at the same time, my great-grandfather, he always, he never stopped looking for her. Another source that I have for her is that in 1950 or something, there's a court that declares her death, like he reports the missing, and then she is declared to be deaf, presumably during the war. Okay. But my great-grandfather never, never, ever stopped looking for his daughter when he came back from England. And there's even, and it is a, it's on all news, the, the, new, the new My Heritage feature, but there's an article that shows both their pictures saying, like, Chesterfield girl killed by Nazis um, in a hall with a picture of my great-grandfather and a picture of my grand home explaining, well, what had happened, that she had saved the life of airmen and then she was arrested and sent and she never came back. And the pain and suffering from losing, she was 32 on the day that she was arrested, and the pain of losing her was so massive that they didn't say anything for they just was just not spoken about it was too painful and that silence was passed on generation to generation until that day where i was what i have a home that's called maggie maggie was her uh, nickname so i have a home to maggie and she was a war hero and you're not too i can see why you'd want to talk about her if she has been kind of lost to this silence in history for you to then discover this story I guess you probably felt that you need to tell her story. Absolutely. The more I realized that she was a silent subject and nobody spoke about her and nobody, and I was, but you're giving exactly what the Nazi wanted. You want her to disappear and not tell her story. I framed a picture. I put a picture on the mantelpiece. Obviously, 
I added her on the tree. I, you know, I went to the Red Cross archives and the war records. And also more recently, I really, because I was, all right, um, no, I know more about the true sources and true archives, but what what is going to happen when I'm not going to be there anymore? Because... Obviously, some people in my mother's side of the family, they were interested, but they didn't feel the need to build a legacy for her as much as they were interested about her story and as much as they found it sad and they wanted to know. So I decided a few years back to, I don't know if you know about the cobblestones, the memory cobblestones in some parts of Germany yes. and France uh, and Belgium. Yes, I do. Uh, Stolpersteins. Uh, we heard about those in episode one, The Aunt with Jackie Conestam. They are like memory cobblestones for either people from the Jewish community or uh, That's it. Or for the people being deported during World War War. Yep. And a few years back, I made sure that she had one in front of her house. Because what I would do before that is that each year, on the day of her arrest, because I found it more symbolic that her birthday, on the day of her arrest, I would go and lay flowers on her door. Like the day that her freedom was taken away from her. We don't really know when she died. She was uh, recorded as perished um, in the camp, but we don't have a firm date for the moment she died. Her birthday was not that relevant to the story, but the day, I know for sure the day she was arrested. And so on every 2nd of February, I go to her door and put, flowers and then I was okay but one day I won't be able to do it anymore maybe I'll move somewhere else so maybe you know one year and that was one during the pandemic at some point I couldn't go one year because of, you know it was locked down or something and I was yeah, but I still want people to know about her and that's how the old cobblestone uh, project came so I did a crowdfunding which was uh, successful very thankful for all the donators and she now has a cobblestone in front of her house. And that's a really nice thing to be able to mark because that's where she was last living, last present. Yeah, she was last present. And also we don't have a grave. We don't have a grave. We don't have a tombstone. We don't have anything that with her, that's a representation in the public space that says there was a person named with that name that year of birth, that year of death, in that certain circumstances. There was none. So um, it was just the right thing to do. I was really happy to do it and to give her like yeah. a proper public tribute. How did you feel when you discovered that she was missing from the tree and that people hadn't given you that information? Did you kind of feel a bit kind of cheated from it or disappointed or angry? I felt... And of course, I was like a 17 passionate girl that just, you know, learn about the atrocities of the Second World or not learn, but I mean, dive in school into it. So I felt some anger. I was, I felt some frustration and I felt I had to stood for her. Like, no, it's not right. I know it hurts. Then again, I'm saying this with the point of view of somebody who didn't know her. Sure. But then my mother was born in 1944, so she didn't know her either. But it was really so close in time to all the other people who knew her. But I was, guys, how oh come you don't tell her story? How oh come she does like I compare my husband's grandfather died also in a camp uh, in Buchenwald. And... It was always, when I compare the two processes in the families, his story was always known. His picture was always there. That's how my father-in-law had his study founded. And he was always part of the family history story. When in my part of the family, she was, she was a ghost. And I really wanted to put her in the room and say, no. She had existed. Yes, it hurts, of course, but I don't think it's going to hurt less if you just, you know, wipe her from the books and not state that she's not there at all. So, yes, I'm going to print her picture and frame her picture. And yes, I'm going to put her in the tree. And yes, I'm going to find records and show you the records. 
and we need to know what happened to her and we need to pay her tribute. I mean, there's also this complex Belgian situation where Belgian history is a lot complex, but right. there's this global cliche that the north of the country was standing with the Nazis and the south of the country was in the resistance is not as black and white as that at all. Okay, There were resistance and collaborators on both sides, but it's a very sensitive subject, but some people descending from some collaborators. And again, we all know that we are not responsible for our ancestors' wrongdoings. It's not on us. But some of them are really less, okay, yes, it's that, and I'm really proud of my grandfather. And I'm like, okay. And I would have somehow more understood that if my grandhound was shielded for that reason. But she was a hero. We must have been like proud or do some like a little tea on her birthday or just give her the righteous tribute that she deserved. From the moment I learned that of her existence and her fate, I, I couldn't just like let it in. Okay, all right, I never knew that. I'm just going to head her to the train, do nothing about it. No, that's not the question. No, she she has a place in a family tree and she had a place in a public tribute as well. And that's why I picked her. Well, I can completely understand why you would. Thank you, Marie, for sharing the life story of the very brave Marguerite Nichols. But I think it's now time for you to face... The Brick Wall. Don't you just hate it when the trail of clues comes to a sudden end? We call this our research brick wall and they can be incredibly annoying, lasting anywhere between hours to decades and sometimes beyond. It's now time for my guests to share one of their own brick walls in a hope that one of you dear listeners might just have a clue or a research idea that helps to turn that brick wall to brick dust. Right, Marie, how can we help? Now, we need to go back to the 16th century. Oh, wow. Because uh, I've got several brick walls, but one brick wall that is identified as the brick wall for me and the first one I told up when you mentioned that we would do the exercise is that I'm looking for a baptism records which may no longer exist, but uh, if only I knew where, <laughs> that would already be a start. Well, let's see what the listeners can do for us. I'm looking for a baptism record circa 1540 to 1550-ish. I'm thinking around 1545, but I'm not that certain. Of an ancestor of my husband, Cornelius. His surname is The Letter in Flemish. But it could have been the letter, or le letter, ou la letter. His surname has been absolutely translated, like literally translated. Okay. He had a very interesting life for the pieces that I could gather for him. I found him dead in Antwerp, so Belgium, in the 1620s. He's buried in a church, and sadly enough, the tombstone has been removed from the church. But luckily enough, there's a book with all copies of tombstones of all the parts of the church, and is is copied, uh, so I know what was written on his grave. And his wife has not at all a um, surname from Antwerp. She has a surname from the south of the country. And he was the former general treasurer of the city of Antwerp. He has many children. He leads a very wealthy life. All of his children have very um, interesting life. At some point, he disowned one of his sons because one of his sons has a feud with another brother. And obviously, apparently, the father takes sides and choose one brother over the other. And I have a mention of a document in an article that says that the father writes to the, the son that he disowns, saying that he messed up the business he had with the other brother. <laughs> like, and you messed up too bit. Now you are disowned and I'm going to give your share to the other brother because you, you, you messed up. Okay, right. 
it seems that he was, there's a source mentioning, but it's very an indirect source, that he had taken part in the Battle of Lepanto. In Greece, yep. In 1570 against the Turk. But, uh, well, I haven't been able to confirm or deny this. But from what I understand, he came with the Spanish troops during the campaigns of Belgium, all of the way to Antwerp. And apparently, I at I first thought that he had married his wife in Antwerp, but it looks as if he may have married her along the way. And all of the places where her surname is really persistent, there were Spanish troops stationing there. So I couldn't find the wedding either, but I've got clues as to places where he was. But there's a, an indirect, in the former work that I saw at the State Archives in Antwerp, there's a work that says he was from France, and he was the son of a judge in France. No footnotes, no nothing, no source. Oh, yeah. <laughs> typical. And I'm like, okay, right. And and he says, like, okay, he was the son of Hugues de Lettre uh, from France. And Hugues de Lettre was uh, an attorney or judge in 16th century France. I can find that one person with that namesake, with that position, I'm not sure is his father. I may aim for him being his uncle, but I still have, because I've got no place for Cornelis, I can't find his baptism, so I can confirm whether it's the father or the uncle. And I've done a bit of research regarding that famous Hugues. So, okay, maybe while broadening about Hugues, maybe that will lead me back to Corneille. Uh, but nope, I have gathered some evidence about the life of Hugues, but nothing that leads back to Corneille. And so if he was born in France, where? That's something. So the court where Hugues was working in moved quite a bit because it was at the time with, I think it was Henry IV, possibly, and the attorneys were moving with the king. Yeah, I guess you'd go where the work is. So, um, Hugh was moving with them and I have created like a log of, okay, I find his name that, that plays that day. Let's see if there are parishes registered for that town. <laughs> but, uh, so far, no Corneille. Um, I even checked Italian possible sources to see if there were like reports of the Battle of Lepanto with members being there, like high members being there to confirm or deny that he took part in the battle or whether he stayed afterwards with the Spanish troops. All that I know is that he died in Antwerp in the beginning of the 17th century, that his wife seems to have a French-speaking name we could match with the explanation that he married her going along with the troops and then taking her along to Antwerp and settling there. But yes, that's one of my biggest brick wall is to find his baptism. And I've been, you know, searching for many, many hours. I've left it on the side sometimes, as I was saying at some point, when you just turn around and it just um, feds you up more than anything, you just leave it for a bit. But... Uh, Hopefully one day I will find him. Wow, Marie, that is quite a brick wall. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and it sounds like this person is quite well known, but not to you because of the movement and the ambiguity of the names. And I can understand why they would follow the king around. But for you as a researcher, you've got this journey that you potentially need to follow as well and look at all of the records on that journey to try and find your answer. If it's there. The known part of the life of Cornelius Corneille is already so interesting because from his time in Antwerp and his children and the fates of his children and grandchildren and descendants up to my Charlotte, who is a descendant of of his, there are like hundreds of records regarding them. So in a way, there's a lot about that family. And in a way, when I uh, come to 
his early life, it's like he just appeared <laughs> in Antwerp, which is not true because they all mentioned that, you know, he was not from the town. The surname is not from the town. The surname of his wife is not from the town either. So that's kind of a brick wall. <laughs> if I could at least find a source that mentioned where he was from, that would be something. Yeah, that would be good if you could find that information now. Just to confirm, could you confirm his name again, please? Okay, so his name in Flemish is Cornelis de Letter, D-E space L-E-T-T-E-R, so de Letter. And some sources mentioned that it could have been Corneille de Lettre. So Corneille, the French version of Cornelis, and then de Lettre, D-E space L-E-S-T-R-E, de Lettre, de Lettre, which would have been translated into de Lettre in Antwerp. Well, okay. Well, if you think that you have a research idea or a clue that could help break this brick wall for Marie, you can email us at hello at familyhistoriespodcast.com and we'll pass it along to her. So message me on socials. Yep, which we will link to within the description of this episode. But you can also head over to familyhistoriespodcast.com to read this episode's show notes. That would be great. Now, whilst the listeners go and start up their brick wall busting bulldozers, I think I might just be able to give you some help with this. But you're going to need to follow me through to the garage. Oh. Here we are, one secret time machine. Really? Are you kidding me? No, no. This, Marie, is a highly calibrated, recently refuelled, fully functional, incredibly scientific time machine. What's that burning smell? What burnt? Oh, Shandor? Yes? Is there something on fire? No. Good. Not anymore. What? I got more of that nice bread, but I singed my shoes. Oh, that wasn't from Pudding Lane again, was it? Yes. Oh, I've told you before, Shandor, 1666 was not a good year for the Great British Bake Off in London. Anyway, Marie's here to try the time machine. She wants to go back to France. Remind me of the date? France? In the middle of the 16th? Uh, yeah, let's try the 28th of May, 1545, in Lille, France. Really nice pastry. Okay, I will set this. Great. Well, while Shandor does that, you'll need this. What is this? That is a temporal beacon. Keep it with you at all times, and when you're ready to come home, just press the big, yep, that one, on the top, and you'll be back in a flash. Got it! It's ready. Right, here we go. Marie Kapar. Thank you, goodbye, and good luck. Yep, she's there. Great. Uh, did they have any... Scones? No, scones. What? <laughs> Never mind. The Family Histories podcast was presented and produced by me, Andrew Martin. My guest was the awesome Marie Kapar with John Spike and Shandor Paterfi. If you've enjoyed this episode, then why not share it with your friends on social media? Thank you for listening. Approximately no family historians were harmed in the making of this podcast.